Folks, all this time we've been using pandas wrong. We keep saying that it's slow, but what I'll show you today will absolutely blow your mind. Because today we will use our graphics cards to make pandas run much, much faster. Specifically, we will install a brand new QDF Pandas Accelerator mode and we will compare it with Pandas itself. But the best part is, we do not need to change anything in our code. We will use the same commands as usual, just 30 times faster. So what exactly are we waiting for? Let's roll! So on the menu, we have a dataset with 1.6 million tweets, which we will clean and transform for our speed test. We will use a process called feature engineering, as in manipulating data, to highlight only the important detail. So we basically focus on meaningful information and dispose of everything that is not. And since this process consumes lots of resources, it is perfect for benchmarking. Now, before we begin, there's one important detail. Since CUDIF stands for CUDA, data frame, I highly recommend watching my CUDA tutorial first. But for this video, all you need to know is that CUDA is only compatible with NVIDIA graphics cards, and its main purpose is to delegate tasks from our processor or CPU to our graphics card or GPU. And that's because graphics cards are particularly good with running tasks in parallel. CPUs, on the other hand, not so much. So if we have a giant dataset with millions upon millions of values that we keep revising and transforming and expanding, maybe it's a good idea to do so on GPU. And that's exactly what we'll do next. So let's begin by installing QDF Pandas. For this, we will need a Windows subsystem for Linux, which sounds a bit scary, but all it is is just running Windows PowerShell as administrator and typing WSL dash dash install. And boom, we are done. Now, once we reboot our system, we will then find a new WSL terminal inside our start menu. So let's click it. Now, the first thing we'll do here is check the state of our graphics card. We can do this with NVIDIA-SMI. Now, on my end, I'm working with GeForce RTX 4080 and CUDA version of 12.3. Now, once we know our version of CUDA, we can then go ahead and install QDF. And a good way to do so is by using Anaconda. But even though we may have Anaconda installed on our system, it doesn't mean that we have it installed on our subsystem. So let's take care of that. We'll quickly navigate to the installation guide that I included in the description. We will copy the Miniconda download command and we will paste it in our terminal. Let's run it. And once our installation file was downloaded, we will go ahead and run it with bash, followed by the name of the file, which we will just copy from the terminal. We'll of course carefully read the license agreement using enter. We will then agree to all the terms and conditions with yes. We will confirm the installation location with enter, and we will type yes again to initialize Conda. Congratulations, Miniconda is officially installed, but now we need to close and reopen our current terminal instance. So let's do it. Now, once Miniconda is installed, we will scroll to the very top of our installation guide and we will make sure we are choosing the following options. We will need the stable release, which we will install with the Conda method, and then we will choose our version of CUDA, or in my case, a close enough version of CUDA, which will also work. We will go for Python 3.10 and we will choose a specific package of QDF. Now, let's quickly copy the command we have generated, but before we run it on our subsystem, we will need to type bash to make sure that we are entering our base environment. And from this environment, we can then go ahead and call the command we just copied. But on my end, I'm going to make a tiny change. So instead of rapids 23.10, I will call my environment faster pandas, which is a bit easier to remember. Now let's quickly run it. Great, we have officially installed QDF. So let's quickly navigate to our environment. We will activate it with Conda Activate Faster Pandas. And now let's see it in action. For this, we will open our favorite notebook editor. In my case, I'll pip install Jupyter Lab. And I will run it with Jupyter 
lab dash dash allow dash root. And we can finally start our data science project to see the difference between CPU and GPU processing. Specifically, we will prepare data for a task called sentiment analysis, which is all about determining the meaning of text. So for example, the person who wrote this message is very happy, but the person who replied is very sad. Humans can tell it right away, but it is much more difficult for computers. So let's try to help them. For this, we will create a new notebook and we will download some raw data. In our case, a dataset named Sentiment140, which is all about tweets with either positive or negative meaning. We will get this data with exclamation mark wget, followed by the URL of the dataset, which you can find in the description. I'm just going to paste it and I will run this cell. Now, once our download is complete, we will navigate to our file tree where we will find a brand new zip archive. Now we can actually unzip it with code. So we'll just type from zip file, import zip file, this time with a capital Z and a capital F. Then right below, we will create a zip file instance to which we will pass the name of our file. And I'm just going to copy it. It is training and test data dot zip. We'll specify it as a string inside zip file and we will assign it to archive. Then we will call right below archive dot extract all followed by an empty set of round brackets. And when we run this cell, we can navigate to our file tree where we will see two brand new CSV files. Now, the file we are looking for is the training data, not the test data. And if you're struggling to see the name, we can always call exclamation mark ls, which will list all the files in the current directory. And the full name of our data set is training 1.6 million process no emojis CSV. We will definitely need it for later. But for now, let's get QDF pandas involved. For this, we will use the magic command of percentage symbol load underscore ext as in load extension, followed by the name of QDF.pandas. Now, once we load it, we can then call import pandas as PD as per tradition. But this time we are not dealing with regular pandas. We are dealing with the accelerated version instead. So it may look and it may work like pandas, but this one is capable of running both on CPU and on GPU, depending on the task. Great. Now let's load our data with pd.readcsv to which we will pass the name of our training file from above. We will specify it as a string and we'll assign this expression to data. But before we run this cell, let's quickly print the first few records with data.head. And actually, let's focus on the first three records by specifying three. Now let's run it. Let's have a look. And oops, it looks like the very first record was used to name our columns. So let's quickly fix it by adding the argument of header and setting it to none. And beautiful. But the only problem is much of this data is not really important to us. We only care if something is positive or negative. We don't care about when it was said, what kind of ID number we gave it, and we most certainly don't need an entire column of no queries. So let's get rid of them. So right above, we will type data dot drop, where we will set the columns argument to a list with a string of one, a string of two, and a string of three, as in the names of the unnecessary columns. Now let's quickly reassign this expression back to data. And great, now we are only left with the labels, which can either be negative zero or positive four. We are left with the user who wrote the tweet as well as the tweet itself. So let's give those columns appropriate names rather than numbers with data that columns, which we will assign to a list of labels, user and tweet. Actually, let's do it label rather than labels just to keep things consistent. Now let's run it and perfect. Now our data is loaded and properly, but so far there is nothing new here. Everything looks and works exactly like pandas. So how do we even know that our GPU is involved? 
Well, we can always print the profile of our commands by using the magic command of double percentage symbol kudf.pandas.profile. Let's run it. Let's scroll down where we see a detailed list of all the commands that were executed on GPU. In fact, we made zero calls to our CPU. Now, you must be wondering, why do we need two different components if they're doing the exact same thing? Can't we just get rid of processors and run everything on GPU? Not yet. There are certain things that only CPUs can do, at least at this point of time. So for example, if we set the encoding of our data to Latin-1, we change the way that our data is stored in memory. We use one byte for each character, and we restrict the number of characters we are allowed to use. But by doing so, let's quickly comment out the rest of our commands. Let's rerun this cell, and we will see that our read CSV command is no longer executed on the GPU. It automatically falls back to the CPU. And that's because every little communication with memory can only happen through our processor. Our memory is connected to the CPU, and the CPU is connected to the rest of the components, so we can imagine it as a gatekeeper for memory operations. Now for the speed test, let's do something a bit more complex than just dropping and renaming a bunch of columns. Let's do something called feature engineering, where we take some raw data and we make it much more meaningful, at least for our task. So let's extract all the tagged usernames from every tweet and let's store them in a separate column. For this, we will select data in the column of tweet that has the type of str as in string, and we will call the find all method on it. Now, we use this method to detect patterns, which is a big topic on its own. So for now, all we need to know about patterns is that they are strings that in our case begin with an at symbol and end with a backslash capital S plus, where backslash represents the end of the sequence, a capital S represents all the characters other than space, and plus represents the entire word. So we are basically selecting all the characters that follow an at symbol up until the very first instance of space. Great, now let's run it. And perfect, it worked. Now let's go ahead and store these values in a separate column by assigning our expression to data in the column of at. And if we're already here, we might as well do the same for our hashtags. We'll just copy our command and we will replace every instance of at with an instance of hashtag. And let's do the same for all the URLs as well. We will call this column URL and we will start our pattern from HTTP. Now let's print our first few values with data.head. Let's give it a quick run and beautiful. It worked! We have stored all our usernames, tags, and all the links in separate columns, which is something called feature extraction. Now we can replace them inside every tweet with something a bit more generic, as in feature reduction. Now a cool trick is to first convert our entire column of tweets to lowercase. For this, we will copy our latest command and we'll of course slightly adjust it. We will replace the find all method with the lower method. And we will also reassign this expression back to the column of tweets. And now when it's time to replace our usernames, we will copy this new command we created. We will replace the lower method with the replace method where the first argument is the pattern, which we will copy from above and the second argument is what we would like to replace it with. In my case, user in all caps. And that way it is extra easy to detect because the rest of our data is lowercase. Now let's do the same for our hashtags. We'll replace them with tag in all caps and we'll do the same for the links, URL in all caps. Great, now let's run it and beautiful. It worked! We have officially replaced the original values with their generic placeholders. Yay! Because in the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if Bob is upset that he can't update his Facebook or if Charlie is upset, the meaning remains the same. Additionally, URLs are not meaningful and if we take a look at some of the hashtags, 
we see that computers may find them a little bit confusing because it is not always clear where charity ends and where Tuesday begins. Who knows, maybe what they really meant is char, IT, and so on and so on. And perfect, now we have enough actions to run our speed test. We will finally see just how much time we saved with QDF pandas. And actually, let's make it even more interesting. Let's enlarge our data set with for i in range 4, where we will assign data to pd.concat where we will concatenate our data to itself. And then right below our for loop, when we print the new length of our data, we see that we are dealing with 25 million rows instead of 1 million point six of them, which is way more complex, so it is perfect for our speed test. Then we will go ahead and comment out our profiling command, as well as our loading extension command, which will take us back to regular pandas, not the accelerated one. Then we will add the magic command of percentage symbol, percentage symbol time to the very top of our speed test cell, which just as it sounds will time the execution of this cell. Now to keep things fair, we will go ahead and restart our kernel with 00, zero and then restart. Now we are ready to import regular pandas and we are ready to load our dataset which gives us some kind of error. So let's see what's going on here. And okay, it looks like our CPU is not too happy with some of the characters. We have some encoding issues. So let's just add a new argument inside read CSV. We will add encoding underscore errors, and we will set it to ignore, or actually not ignore, let's set it to replace, because it is not the best practice to ignore problems. Now let's go ahead and run this cell and we get another error. What? What is wrong with you, CPU? What do you mean? You cannot find our column names in Axis. We've seen them with our own eyes. So let's try something else, okay? So inside drop, maybe let's specify our column names as integers rather than strings. It might fix it. Let's give it a run. And great, it worked. <laughs> Thank you, CPU. We are finally ready for our speed test. So let's give it a quick run, hopefully quick. And on my end, I am getting one minute and three seconds on my rogue build, which means my 12th gen i9 CPU, as well as my 64 gigs of RAM. You can find the rest of the components here, but these two are the most important ones. And actually, for 25 million rows, one minute is pretty impressive. But now let's see what happens when we switch back to QDF pandas. For this, we will go ahead and restart our kernel with 00, zero again. We will then uncomment our load extension command and we will import QDF pandas. Then we will go ahead and load our data and we are finally ready for the speed test. So if it takes my CPU one minute and three seconds, it would take my GPU two seconds, almost precisely. Holy smokes, you guys. We are talking about 63 divided by 2.01, which is 31 times faster. Wow. Now, the funny thing is I am getting very similar results on my Alienware system. Even though it has completely different components, I'm getting 64 seconds for my CPU and two seconds for my GPU. Now, to be fair, on this rogue system, I am filming this tutorial. So I have OBS Studio open here. <laughs> so it probably takes some processing power. But generally speaking, QDF Pandas runs 30 times faster than Pandas on my end. It could be a coincidence, so please let me know what kind of results you're getting. Now let's finish this video with a challenge. What is the fastest way to perform the same actions? It doesn't have to be with Pandas or with Sentiment 140, but it must be with Python, where the tasks are extraction of keywords from strings, as well as the removal of those keywords after they were extracted. How would you do it? Please share your experience in the comments below and I will showcase my favorite solutions in an upcoming speed contest. And thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful, please share it with the world and don't forget to leave it a huge thumbs up. If you'd like to see more videos of this kind, you can always subscribe to my channel and turn on the notification bell. I'll see you very soon in another awesome simplified tutorial. In the meanwhile, bye bye